Um, well, no, it wasn't on schedule, and then they were like, I want to do this, and I was like, well, I've already All right, <laughs> so um, today, guys, we are going to be starting limits. calculus. So limits, um, <clears throat> the whole idea of calculus is studying rates of change. That's it. You are experienced with the very common rate of change called slope. Slope is a change in y over change in x. And it doesn't always have to be y and x. That's just how we normally label our x and y axis. If I was talking about time and velocity, it would be a change in velocity over time. We call that acceleration. It might be time and position. And if I had a change in position over time, Call that velocity. There's all kinds of rates of change. It could be number of gallons over time. It could be gallons per minute that's pumped out of a well or something. So rates of change is a study that we look at in calculus. And that whole idea of finding a rate of change is called a derivative. All right? Now, a derivative is half of calculus. The other half is called an antiderivative or an integral. So I love calculus because it's one of the actual first times you're going to take all this math you've been learning and it's going to mean something. You know, I know we've done real life problems like, you know, Biff buys 200 watermelons for a dollar. I mean, those aren't real life problems, but calculus really allows you to start looking at how these things actually function in real life. And it could be so many different applications, whether it's economic theory or financial theory physics. Um, there's so many different ways calculus is applied. Uh, it's really pretty cool. Even the formulas like in geometry, like the formula you learn for volume of a sphere and you had to memorize it in geometry. Well, all I have to do is take a semicircle and rotate it about an axis and calculate volume with an integral. We're doing that right now. And it's not hard. In my class third period, 18 out of the 19 people made A's. We had a 100.3 class average. I mean, that's a volume test, and that formula comes from that. So a lot of what you do, even in geometry and other branches of math, has been defined in calculus. You just don't know that in ninth grade, so you memorize the formula. But to be able to do a derivative, that study of slope or rates of change, to be able to do that, the definition of a derivative is based on what we call a limit. All right? So in your new book, dang it, kill my momentum here. In your new book, I'm handing you. Uh, Are we gonna look at our test? Maybe. It's, I don't think that's a magnet. Oh, dang! This one's not magnetic. This one? No. Dang it. No. Thanks for the help, guys. Oh, there's push pins. Then you could oh. stick them to the cork. Let's go. Well, they're on the. That's not a pin. No. <laughs> no, look, look. Just hold on. <laughs> look. No, there's on the cork. Look, above all. To the, the left. left. Oh, I see. Yeah. The square of B. Oh, oh my goodness. This is big. You could. Nope. <laughs> that, was nice. not, that was not the best way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Can anybody even read that? Yeah. No. Verse of band show. <laughs> Why is it too explanation? 6.30 till later. <laughs> oh. oh yeah. Just oh, no. <laughs> Til Til later. Till <laughs> later. <laughs> He's not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I can't read the address, so it looks like I can't call. It's Downey Drive. All right, guys. So um, today we're going to jump into. Um, yeah, this may be the last book y'all get from me. Oh my god! Oh, Wait, you have to come back. Yeah. Well, no. I mean, if I am back, some of you are taking BC. I'm not giving you a book in BC. No, I don't. Um, anyway, um, uh, so we're going to start limits, guys. Um, we're going to have one or two limits tests, we're going to have one or two derivative tests, and we'll have a finance test, and that'll make up your fourth nine weeks. Um, 
limits, is of, if you look at limits and derivatives, limits for most people seems to be a little harder because there's so many different ways to think about limits and it can, people try to compartmentalize it. It's hard to compartmentalize it because there's different strategies that you will use. Derivatives, I think you'll really like. Normally my class average on my derivative tests are A's, um, sometimes high A's, so I think most people do pretty well on that. And then finance, most people do really well on the little finance test. It's really more for me to, like I'm trying to give you a little grade at the end that helps. Um, so anyway, um, we're gonna jump into limits. Limits, the idea of a limit, is, and you will see this, uh, is what we're gonna use to define a derivative. So a limit, the definition of a limit, um, I'm sorry, the definition of a derivative, you will use a limit, and that's why we talk about limits before derivatives. But in a cruel twist of fate, you will find that the actual derivative allows you to do something called L'Hopital's Rule, and I'll probably mention L'Hopital's Rule 30 times before you actually learn it. But once you learn derivatives, L'Hopital's Rule will allow you a little trick to doing a lot of the limits that gave you a lot of trouble. So, um, but sadly, it's like, what do you put first, the cart or the horse? Um, it was the chicken or the egg? I don't know. So we're going to do limits, then go into derivatives, and after we do derivatives, you'll be like, crap, man, I wish I'd have known derivatives when I did limits. All those problems would have been easy because of L'Hopital's rule. But whatever. Next year, when you recover limits and derivatives in A, B, or B, C, you will have L'Hopital's rule, and the rest of the regular pre-cal people will not, and you will have an advantage on that, on that limit step. So what you're learning right now, you're going to repeat in AB. If you're in BC, you will repeat it like that. Like maybe he spends a day on limits, a day on derivatives, boom, moves on. So he really, really moves the material to try to be able to get all the material in and still have some time for you to review. And again, I would look at things like your nine weeks grade and look at your limits and derivatives test. And if you're doing really well on those, um, use that as a guide to whether you think you can handle uh, BC. Because if, you are, uh, if you're struggling on a nine weeks test, like putting large groups of information together, or you're struggling on limits and derivatives, keep in mind that BC moves really quickly. And in AB calculus and BC calculus, unlike this class, this class I think of it as a lot of little compartmentalized subjects. If you stink on conic sections, that's okay, because we're done with conics, right? Now we're looking at sequences and series. You stink on sequences and series, that's okay. We're done with that, now we're moving on to polar. But in calculus, it's not a bunch of little hills, it's a bunch of steps. So if you stink on this and this and this, all of a sudden that next step is really hard to get to because you're still down here, right? And it is a cumulative thing. So those are things to think about um, when you take BC uh, because um, even though, and again, everybody in here I think can handle BC, but the question is, do you want to handle it or do you want to thrive in it? So to me, I think, yeah, everybody can go in there and suck it up. My daughter took BC when I told her, I was like, what are you doing? I mean, she was an A student in here, but I was like, you don't need it for college. But she took it, and she said she loved the class. But I remember her studying seven hours for a BC test. And, I mean, like my AB students don't do that. So you just got to ask yourself, at what level, what sacrifice do you willing to have? And if you don't need it for college, um, but you're like a 99 average student in here, and you're like, oh, I can handle it, that's one thing. But if, you, but if you don't need it for college and, you're, and you got a high B in here or something like that or maybe a low A, just kind of ask yourself, why am I doing this? Especially if your workload next year is really high or really big because it, everything, it comes at a cost. You know, so it's just, an, and what level do you want to really know? Do you want the comfort? Like ask Akram or Sam Jones, guys like that that are in my class that should have taken probably, that were, had the ability to take BC and it's just very comfortable for them. You know, they really are happy. It's a little slower. They do the homework they need to do. They got a strong A. They can focus their attention on other subjects. So just something to think about. Um, I want you guys to be in, in the best place you need to be. But, um, but I would rather you have an A and AB than have a high C or a low B and BC and your head spinning. You know what I'm saying? You constantly feel like a little desperate and you don't really – fully grasp material because he's moving so quickly. So anyway, I tend to baby my students, I guess, for a lack of a word, even though it's an AB class, it kind of feels like that because I do so much review time to help those kids that are coming from regular pre-cal that aren't used to that pacing, that need a better, a better review. Uh, that's why my class tends to be a little easier for my students. You know what I mean? Anyway, 
um, like to put it perspective, I got a girl currently in my class who I had in 10th grade made C's for me in 10th grade. High C's. She might have had a low B once, but pretty much high C's. She goes, I'm out. She took regular pre-cal last year. She's back in here now. She's made 104 on her volumes test. Has a very strong A. Will probably make a five because it just it's more comfortable for her in an AB class. So anyway, jump to that first page of this book, and let's jump jump in the limits. And by the way, there is a really good chance that that we will uh, that we will not be keeping up the pacing. I have an idea of what I'd like to do, and sometimes we'll get behind. We'll be up behind for two or three days, and then we'll catch up. So don't worry about that. If we don't get to something, I'm not a, a homework guy where I'm like, too bad, put it in. I mean, we have to hand it in a little bit later. No worries. Um, we're just going to do what we can. So this first day, we're going to be talking about hopefully two kinds of limits, um, but specifically um, one particular idea about limits. So. First thing I want to talk about is what the actual definition of a limit is. So I'm on page, whatever this is, page seven. All right. And here is your basic general definition of a limit. Okay. And you really got to understand this definition. Okay. Don't just halfway understand it. It's not a hard understanding, but don't halfway understand it. Fully understand it. Okay. So when you're talking about a limit, a limit is the Y value. So if I have a function, I would say, hey, what is the limit of this function? All right, what is the limit of this function? So I'm saying, what is the y value that this function approaches? All right, because that's what a function is. It's f of x or y. So what y value is the graph moving towards as the function moves towards a particular x value from both sides? So think about a big curve, okay? I might be saying, hey, what is the limit of this x of this function as x approaches 4? All right, and I'll show you what that looks like when you write it out. So basically, you got this big function. I would say, okay, here is an x value of 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So what is the graph doing? What y value is the function approach, is it approaching as you move towards this x value from both sides? So like the graph might be moving up towards a point right there but it also might be moving towards an asymptote at x equals four. It might be moving towards a hole at x equals four. Heck, the graph might not even exist at x equals four. Like it might be some square root function over here and there's nothing even there. But, when, but what it is not asking is what y value is there. There's a big difference between what y value is located on that function and what it's approaching. Like there might be a hole situated up five you with me? So what y value am I approaching? Well, I'm approaching the y value of the whole, which happens to be five. But there is no value there. So make sure you get that a limit, and we'll do a lot of these, I think you'll be fine. But a limit is not the y value there. It's the y value that a function is approaching. What is it getting closer and closer to? Okay? And we're going to start by looking at graphs. And when you look at the graph, you'll be able to visualize it. And then after we get done with the graphs, I'm going to give you functions, which you may or might not know what they look like. Most of the time, you're not even going to know what they look like. And you're going to have to use your common sense and your knowledge of what those functions behave like to be able to figure out what's going on there. All right. And I'll walk you through all these. Please ask questions. If you are struggling, I guarantee you somebody else is struggling in the same way and you can be their savior, right, from ignorance. All right. So here we go. Couple things before we get started. Here are some random limit properties. There will come a time, and we'll talk about what all this means, but there will come a time where you do not have a picture of the graph. And when I ask you about a limit, it'll be really ugly looking. These are some ways you can simplify it. So, what this is saying is if you're ever taking a limit of a function and there's a constant out in front of that fun function, and that constant is bringing you stress, you're allowed to factor the constant to the outside. Do the limit, and when you're done, multiply it by that. It's just an option for you if you want to do it. Also, if you have a limit of two different functions being added together, like what if I said, what's the limit of sine x plus 5x? Well, I got a sine x and a 5x. Do you know what sine x plus 5x looks like? No. But do you know what sine x looks like? Maybe. Do you know what 5x looks like? Yeah. Yes. 
So what you could do is take the limit of each one separately and then add them together. That is an option for you if that helps you think. Same thing with addition or subtraction, multiplication or division. All those you can actually break up into two separate limits, evaluate them, and then bring your results back together. And then the last one, if you have a function raised to a power, like sine of x to the fifth, I have no idea what sine to the five x or sine to the fifth x looks like. I'd have no idea. But I do know what sine x looks like. So I could find the limit of the sine x function, and then when I'm done, raise it to the fifth power. That's what this is saying. So these are just a few properties. i got to be honest with you. You will probably not even think about these. You will be doing these naturally by the time you're done. But they are properties that you can, you can think about. So here's what we're going to do first. We're going to look at graphically. So I'm going to give you on the back of this page a graph. It's got all kinds of situations, and we'll talk about those limits. I think most people do really well on the graph part um, as long as I have, ask questions. But I'm going to be asking the questions like this. I'll be going, hey, what's the limit of this function? And you'll be given an actual function, or you'll be given a picture of a function to be able to use. And this is the way I talk about what I'm looking at. If you see x arrow a, that means you need to go on the x-axis, wherever a is. a is positive, go over here, negative, go over here, zero, whatever. Go to that value, and then look at that value, and look at the graph and go, all right, what is the graph doing as it gets closer and closer? As your x's get closer and closer to a from both sides, what's the graph doing? And we'll talk about how to think that way. All right? And by the way, if they don't approach that same y value, like if one side is doing this and the other side is doing this, well, one's approaching a y value up here, one's approaching a y value up here. That's not the same y value. And according to our definition, it's what? It's the y value that a function approaches the y value. That's singular the y value that it approaches as it moves towards an x from both sides. So if it doesn't move towards the same one, we say there is no limit or the limit is, does not exist. Right? Remember on Mean Girls? Has everybody seen Mean Girls? If you haven't seen Mean Girls, you've got to go back and watch Mean Girls. It's probably the best high school movie ever made. It's really funny. I used to make fun of it. I was like, it can't be that funny. And then Helmers was like, it's actually pretty funny. I was like, really? I thought it was just like this dumb flick. It's really, if you know Tina Fey, I mean, very funny human being. She wrote it. Who has not seen it? Can we watch it as a class? I would love to be able to watch it as a class. We sadly do not have the time. That is your homework this I weekend. Did. I did. I actually own the DVD. Like, oh, it, it is. Oh, to the projector. Well, I can you bring it, it in, Kaide. Is it the first Mean Girls or the second one? Oh, the first one. The one with the uh, with uh, Rachel McAdams in it, and uh, what's the girl that's falling off the deep end with the red hair? Lindsay Lohan. Lindsay Lohan. Okay. It's an all-star <laughs> cast, but no, truly, it's funny. And it really, I mean, Homewood's kind of an unusual school in that I know there are cliques, but it's not like big-time school cliques like you see at Hoover or Vestavia. People are, at some level kind of like each other, even in and outside of cliques, and you can be on the freaking math team and not be a moron you know I mean, that doesn't happen much that's like a you're a pariah if you're on a math team oh and by the way i have the math team on being mean girls it's actually pretty fun oh, yeah. um, get some i mean it's you gotta watch it it's really fun but anyway point is um what is the point what was i talking about that's a big tangent you said something about oh yeah on mean girls there's a scene where she's at the state tournament and this she has this limit problem it's just impossible, by the way. Like, it's a horrible limit problem. I typed it in my calculator, and she's right. It doesn't exist. But her logic and her thinking like don't make any sense based on But she goes, if the limit doesn't approach anything, then the limit does not exist. Anyway, that's a line from the movie. But that's what you say when there is no limit. You say the limit does not exist. So, and then, by the way, also, every now and then, I don't want to check the limit from both sides. I want to check it just from one side. So if I want to check it... From the left side of a, of a value, I would say A, and where the exponent would be, I put a little negative. And that means from the left side of A, from the negative side of A, even though it might be at a positive number. And if I want to check from just the right side of a certain value, I put A with a little plus sign where the exponent would be. And that says only check from the right side. But if I don't see that negative or that positive there, that means you check from both sides. All right, And don't confuse that negative or positive that's the exponent 
with a negative or positive out front, which just means look at that negative number. So let's just take a look at these. Here's a graph, and I'm going to walk through all of these with you, but I'm going to leave the picture like this uh, on all of these, and hopefully we'll be in pretty good shape. So checking this out, I'm going to go across one, two, three, four. This right here says, what is the limit of this function? This is f of x as x approaches 3 from what? The right. the right. So here's 3 right here. There's 3. As I move towards it from the right, infinitely close, what y value am I approaching? It looks like I'm approaching that point that has a y value of 2. So the limit is 2. Now I'm looking at the limit of this function as x approaches 3 from the left. Now from the left side, I'm approaching it. Here we go, left, left, left. I'm approaching also that point, and that has a height of or y value of 2. So the limit from the left is also 2. And then on number 3, it says, what's the limit of this function as x approaches 3? Well, literally, when I ask you number 3, your brain needs to be thinking 1 and 2. Every time, if I don't have a plus or minus sign, I'm saying to do one and two, and if I get the same answer for both, then that's the limit as I approach three. So since both of those were two, that means there was a y value that I approached from both sides, right? And that answer is two. Now, number four is not a limit question. Number four is a value question. Number four is saying what? When x is 3, what is y? That's what that's saying. Number 3 is saying when x is approaches 3, what is y? And you'll see on the, on the problems coming up that that's a much different question. So even though on number 4, I'm sorry, I got, I got 2 for number 4 and I got 2 for number 3, even though I got the same answer, you'll see that that means something different as I move on. Check out number 5. What's the limit of this function as x approaches 0 from the right? All right, here's x equals 0. From the right, what am I approaching? Negative 2. I'm approaching that hole, I mean that number, and that, I mean that point, that point has a height of negative 2. All right, look at number 6. What's the limit of this function as x approaches 0 from the left? What am I approaching? I'm approaching the hole, and the hole is at a height of 1. So I'm approaching a value of 1. It doesn't say what I have. Limit doesn't say what is the y value at 0. It says what y value are you approaching as you get closer to 0. 0.5, 0.6, 0.7, 0.8, 0.9, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99. I'm getting closer and closer to what? 1. So both of th those ended up being different though, didn't they? So for number 3, what's the limit as I approach 0? The limit does not exist. So you can say D and E. Why? Because I didn't approach a y value. I didn't approach one particular y value from both sides. If it's different, it's always D and E. All right, what about 8? What does 8 say? When x is 0, what's the y value? What would you say? Negative 2, because that's where the point is. What if they were both holes? Or what if they were both open? What would you say for the value? Then you have to say D and E. What if they were both colored in? What would you say? It's a trick question. It's not a function. So you'll never see that. Okay? All right, look at number nine. Nice. Number nine. What's the limit of this function as x approaches negative two from the right side? So here's negative two. From the right side, what's it approaching? Negative one. All right? Doesn't hit negative one, but the limit doesn't care. What you, what's there, it carries what you're approaching. So from the right side, it approached the hole, which had a height of negative 1. What about from the left side on number 10? Also negative 1. Well, that's the same thing, isn't it? So for number 7, what is the limit of the function as I approach 0? Negative 1. I was approaching the hole. The hole had a y value of negative 1. I'm approaching a negative 1. Now, what does number 8 ask? What value is there? Well, that's totally different than the limit, isn't it? So I can have a limit at zero. It's negative one, but the value at zero was what? D and E. Because there's nothing there. 
And that's the major difference between a limit and a value. A limit can exist where it doesn't exist, where the values don't exist, because you're getting closer and closer to that spot. Does that make sense? It's kind of like, think about like, I can get closer and closer to the edge of the Grand Canyon, right? But I don't want to be at the Grand Canyon. Like I can get closer and closer to that height, but when I step onto that little edge, I just drop thousands of feet, which would be terrible, right? So I don't want to do that, but a limit's like that. I can approach the edge and have something there, but I might not have anything there. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Number nine, what's, I've already done number nine. Uh, number 13, now this is a little bit different because this says X approaches infinity. What do you think I'm at? Yeah. Um, on number 12, you were talking about. Oh, sorry, there is a point there. Sorry, I'm focused on this thing. Um, so there's nothing there, but is there a value at negative two? Yes, sorry about that. So the value would be what? Negative three, but it's totally different from what the limit is. Sorry about that, thanks for it. Now, the only time you don't check from both sides of a limit is when a limit goes forever to one direction. So when you look at number 13, it says the limit of the function as x approaches infinity. When I say as x approaches infinity, I mean, what is the y value doing as you go forever to the right? Well, as I go forever to the right, I can't get on the other side of forever, can I? So in that case, I'm saying, hey, what y value am I approaching? What does it appear like I'm approaching here? It looks like I'm flattening out at the y axis, doesn't it? Normally what I'll do when I'm flattening out at something is I'll put a horizontal asymptote in there to make it clear. Because somebody might argue, yeah, but you're still going up. How do I know you're not continuing to go up and up and up and up? And I'll make that clear on the test. You won't have to worry about that. I, I usually, if it's a horizontal, I put a dotted line right there on a test to make it really clear. And if I don't, I make that thing pointed a little bit more obviously up so you'll know. So this, as I move forever to the right, my limit would be zero. What about as I move forever to the left, as X approaches negative infinity, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm going down. Now, technically, and this is a big thing right here. Technically, am I approaching a Y value? I'm not. So technically, the limit doesn't exist. But in calculus, they define infinity and negative infinity like this. They're going to define infinity. That is terrible. They're going to define infinity as this. The, the, it does not exist, but also it is unbounded in the positive direction. And they're going to define negative infinity as D and E, but unbounded in the negative direction. Now, unbounded means it just goes forever and ever. And if you ever take a horrible class called uh, Elements of Real Analysis or something like that, you'll talk about bound theory. And it's truly, <laughs> it was the most ugly class I've ever taken. Probably average studying seven to eight hours a class day. I went into the final. Have I told you this story? Sure, I have. I went into the final. I had straight A's in grad school. I was thought I was going to be number one in my class. I went into the final with a 78 average. And I kid you not, we would have class. And we would meet at 2 o'clock. We'd study from 2 to 10 or 2 to 12, whatever library was. It was open every, every class day just to do the homework and get the homework in to have a 78 average. It was awful. And me and the three people in my group, we had everybody had C's except this dude named George, who was a genius. And I would say, George, it was on a proof class. And I was like, okay, I understand your proof. Makes perfectly good sense to me. How did you come up with this stuff? He goes, dude, I don't know. I just know. That's what he would tell us. And we were like, that doesn't help us, George. Because on a test, we're going to have to come up with this. He's like, man, I don't know. And he would always wear, ah, I don't have my, do you remember that little thing I had on my on my board? It had the dude, with, it had the little chalkboard, and he was writing it. And it says, then a miracle occurs. And then he wrote some more, whatever. He would wear that was his lucky T-shirt. And he wore that on test day. So that's why I have that on the board, because it's kind of an ode to George. But, um, but brutal class. And uh, on our final, I started doing the math. The final was 60% of your grade. And I'm like, dude, if I get hammered on this final, I could make a D in this class. If I make a D, I can't graduate. 
which means I can't start working here in the fall because I'd have to go an extra quarter to take this class again. And I was starting to kind of panic. And I, can't, I, st I probably studied anywhere between 60 and 80 hours for this exam. Um, I'd memorized every problem in the book. It was, it was awful. And I was sitting like right here, and he handed me my test first, and then he's handing it out. And as he handed it to me, I looked through the test. There were 11 questions. And I was like, okay, I don't even know what he's asking on five. And I know how to do five perfectly. And there was a sixth one. I thought, ah, I don't want to get some credit. I'm like, I'm going to make a 55. And I'm crunching the numbers in my head. I'm like, it's 60% of my grade. I'm going to make a D in this class. And right as I'm starting to panic, he goes, he finishes handing them out. And he goes, all right, guys, I'll tell you what, this test is way too long. You'll never finish it in time. So I'll tell you what, just pick any six problems and I'll grade your best five. And I was like, yes. I was so happy. It was just like this flow of relief. So I just knocked out this test, man. I thought for sure I made 100. I ended up making a 95 on it. Made higher than George. And because uh, George didn't study. Yes. And I went in there and he's like, I remember walking out of there and he was a bound theory problem. He goes, dude, how'd you do the bound theory problem? I was like, uh, it was on page 72 in the book. I just memorized every problem in the book. George didn't study. And, um, and the grades were so bad across the board that my average that went from a 78 to like a 80, I don't know, 87 got scaled. So I ended up getting an A in the class. All right. And graduated number one. Awesome. And my son took that same class last semester. And he's true. He said, Ed, it changes the worst class you've ever seen. But he didn't get as nice a skill. Um, but anyway, back to this. If anybody asks you about a limit and you're going towards a negative infinity or a positive infinity, you are not approaching a Y value. So technically, it's D and E. But because it is unbounded, like this particular one, unbounded in a negative direction, it is moving without bound downward, we're going to put those two thoughts together and just say negative infinity. Are you all with me on that? So like in the Lindsay Lohan example for Mean Girls, it actually wasn't a problem like this. Her problem was on an asymptote. One side was going to negative, one side was going to positive. So because they were approaching two different unbounded, she had to say D and E, okay? If it was both going down, I would say, oh, they're both moving in the same direction. I'm gonna say negative infinity, even though technically it still doesn't exist because the definition is what again of a limit? The Y value. And going down forever is not approaching a Y value. Infinity is not a value, okay? It's an idea where you're going in a certain direction. All right, what about this next one? Uh, what is the value of f at infinity? Well, put a big x through both of those. People look at this all the time and they go, oh, f of infinity would have to be zero because it's, it's flattening out over here. Well, guess what? Your thinking on f of infinity is what you're doing on number 13. So you'll never be asked a question f of infinity because you can only be asked what f of a value is and infinity is not a value. So that's kind of a trick question. You can cross those out. All right, look at these next few. Yeah. Is number 14 negative infinity or is it D? It's number 13 is zero, number 14 is negative infinity. And DNA. Because negative infinity means DNA. But I'm not going to stop short and say just DNA because it is going down there. And I can't go to the other side, check the other side, because I'm this is going forever to the right. I'm going down, right? It's never going to turn and come back up, or I don't have any indication that it's going to do that. Are y'all seeing that? Okay, what about this next group of problems? Look at 17, 18, 19, 20. 17's asking you, what is the limit of this function as I approach negative 2 from the right? Here's negative 2. So from the right-hand side, what's going on? There's negative 2. From the right, what am I doing? I'm going up. So I must be approaching infinity. Even though I'm not approaching a y value, so I should say DNA, infinity lets me say both. Doesn't exist, there's no Y value I'm approaching, but it is going up forever, I say infinity. What about 18? What's the limit as I approach negative two from the left side? Also infinity. So on 19, what's the limit as I approach negative two? Well, because I'm going to infinity and infinity, I say infinity. But if I were to, it's a trick question, if I were to turn around right now and say, 
does the limit exist at negative two? Don't say yes because you put infinity. Because what does infinity mean? Does not exist. So even though we're writing an answer there, because that answer makes more sense, it gives us more information, right? It's better than just saying, oh, DNA. It's better. And by the way, on AP calculus, sometimes you'll go to the AP test and they'll give you that problem and they won't have infinity as an option. They won't have it. You're like, why don't I have it as an option? But they will have DNA as an option. So what's the most right? DNA. So if they don't offer an infinity, then take the next best thing, because that's still true. All right, what about um, f of negative 2? Doesn't exist. All right, nothing there. What about um, x approaches 3 from the right? Going down forever, so negative infinity. What about x approaches 3 from the left? Positive infinity. What about x approaches 3? D and E, because it's different directions or different ideas. And then finally, what's f of 3? Any. What about number 25? What about X approaches infinity on this one? Now this one's kind of up in the air, right? It kind of looks like it might be like a logarithm graph. And if it was a logarithm graph, what's that thing doing? It's still going up, isn't it? But it also looks like it might be flattening out at an asymptote. So if it were me, I'd probably just say it's going up forever because I didn't put the little dotted line in there. But again, you won't have any issues like that on the test. I'm pretty clear on the test. If I want to show that it's going up, I usually make it pointed more up. Are you with me on that? So if I want it like this flattening out, I usually put an asymptote in there so you can tell. So if around this one on 25, if you put 3 because it's flattening out at 3, or if you put infinity because you think it's continuing to rise, either one I would take on that. What about a negative infinity? Yeah, it looks like this thing is just diving downward, doesn't it? So I would definitely say negative infinity there. What about the limit as x approaches 0? What's the limit as x approaches 0? And I didn't put a negative or a positive, so you got to check both sides. What's it approaching from the left? No, 0. Here's 0. What's happening as I approach it from the left? What's the height? 1.5? What about from the left? 1.5, so what's the limit as I approach zero? About 1.5, and you're gonna see a lot of those that look, just guess, 1.4, 1.6, I don't care, 1.5. And now what is F of zero? One, two, three. Are y'all seeing this? All right, the bell's about to ring. Um, you've got this limits from graphs homework. I know that also your homework very well may say, hear me out on this. Where is your limits homework? It may say to do the algebraically one, do not do that. We haven't even talked about that. So just do the limits from graph homework and we'll call it a day. And um, we'll see y'all later. So if you're not here next year, is it going to be Mr. Homer's teaching? Maybe. 22 seconds.